have chosen to be New Zealand citizens. You know, we're, those of us who are lucky enough to have been born that way don't have to worry about these things, but some people really want to be Kiwis, and it's great when they have the opportunity for, to do that. Yeah, I know from experience, I went to one last year for a, a series we made, and it's it's a very moving thing mm. for people to, yeah. to take on, and it's not something that people take lightly either, either mm. is it? It's five to five. You're listening to the panel on RNZ National Beer. We're going to talk about beer. As you mentioned, Heather, it's World Day for Water today. Mm. And we've just learned this afternoon that growing hops for beer uses an unbelievable amount of water. Scientists from the University of California at Berkeley have come up with a workaround for this. They've been experimenting and they've joined brewers yeast, mint and basil genomes and voila it tastes well how does it taste i don't know how it tastes neil miller might he might have heard about it welcome to the panel sir always a pleasure beer without hops any good well it's hard to tell because i i haven't tasted it yet i mean the hops is my favorite ingredient in beer It, it, it provides so much flavor the juiciness the fruitiness the bitterness um and to think of making a beer without it with some sort of scientific substitute uh, is difficult. The problem that I have as as sort of a beer lover is that they did a blind taste test at Lagunitis Brewery and that's one of my favourite breweries in the world. It's a fantastic brewery from California. They actually picked the scientific version as being more tasty in a blind taste test and these guys really know their beer so for me it's kind of confusing. Yes, well, it's sounding positive, isn't it, from that from that side of things. How big is the hop industry here in New Zealand? Uh, well, it's, we have about uh, 24, I think, hop um, farms, and our hops are so popular that about 80% of them are exported um, straight away. Uh, they can't meet uh, domestic demand, they can't meet international demand. Um, leading beer writers around the world, uh, particularly Stephen Beaumont from Canada, have said, uh, New Zealand beer is defined by a hop character because it's so unique, it's so interesting, and it's because of the soil, it's because of the, the varieties that we make. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think the, the development of this um, artificial hops or synthetic hops is probably going to be of more interest to big brewers who right. want a lot of hops that are consistent, uh, whereas I think the craft brewers are continue to be interested in the more artisan, uh, smaller varieties of hops. Are you beer drinkers? Either I, of you? Yes, I do. I like a beer. It's great. Do you have a preference? Like, are you more of a craft beer, small small batch type beer? Uh, or I, I I like the the hop taste. I, I like the stronger taste. So um, I, I'm looking forward to trying one of these uh, synthetic beers. Well, uh, that's probably the wrong wrong term for it. <laughs> but it sums it up, doesn't it? What about you, Heather? No, well, I have to confess to being more of a wine drinker. But uh, but wine is even less water efficient than beer. Although the report from um, the people who had developed the hop Plus beer did say that genetically modified beer tasted of fruit loops and orange blossom with no discernible off flavours. And that actually sounds quite appealing, so I'd give it a go. Yeah, it sounds. It mm. almost sounds like a wine description, doesn't it? Does. It? it does. It does. Neil, Maybe that's why I like it. <laughs> if you're a hop fan, apparently this tastes hoppier, so, so perhaps it's going to be right up your street. We'll see. <laughs> Neil Miller on the panel. Thank you very much to you both, to Kerry Spackman in Auckland and Heather Roy in Wellington. Thanks, Thanks Noel. Noel. Thanks. And we'll be back on the panel again tomorrow with Amanda Miller will be with us in Christchurch and we'll also be joined by Raybon Khan. News is next at five. Tonight on Checkpoint, the former chairman of the Waikato DHB, Bob Simcock, tells us he wishes he'd never met its former CEO, Nigel Murray, in an exclusive interview tonight. Mr Simcock says Mr Murray did not reveal he'd been sacked from his previous job. This comes as the State Services Commission report released today slams Dr Murray's unauthorised and unjustified spending. We discussed too what some of that spending was on. Also tonight, Barack Obama's private trip turns public with an official welcome and a rousing hucker at Government House this afternoon. The Housing Minister, Phil Twyford, says he'll look at banning the practice of rent bidding after a checkpoint investigation. And Jonathan Coleman quits politics. 
RNZ News at 5 o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. The State Services Commissioner says he would have fired Waikato DHB head Nigel Murray if he had worked for him. Peter Hughes today released the findings of a State Services Commission investigation into spending by the former Chief Executive during his three years in the job. It found Dr Murray spent $218,000 of board funding on travel, accommodation and related expenses. More than half of that amount was unjustified and about half was unauthorised or had authorisation issues. Mr Hughes says it was completely unacceptable. Dr Murray's conduct here I view as totally unacceptable. If Dr Murray had been employed by me, I would have terminated his employment based on what I have seen in this inquiry. Peter Hughes says the DHB, which agreed to end an internal investigation when Dr Murray resigned last October, put pragmatism ahead of principle and public interest. The DHB's former chair says the report doesn't fully address how the spending was able to happen. Speaking to Checkpoint this afternoon, Bob Simcock says while he was chair, unauthorised spending was taking place without his knowledge. I think they have seriously missed, though, uh, the need to ask the question, uh, how could this happen? And in my mind, there is a very simple answer to that that they've chosen not to look at. And that is from day one, uh, the Accounts Department of Waikato DHB paid bills that had never been authorised by anybody. Bob Simcock says he wishes he had never met Nigel Murray and believes Dr Murray's former employer in Canada withheld from the Waikato DHB the true nature of his departure from that job. And that interview will be on Checkpoint shortly. The Health Minister was not told the full extent of the leaky and rotting buildings at Middlemore Hospital. David Clark yesterday announced an extra $11.5 million to fix one of the buildings, but it's been revealed he wasn't told about three other badly damaged buildings. Documents released to RNZ News under the Official Information Act show the county's Monaco District Health Board has known about critical problems at its Kids First Hospital, the Scott and Mackendo buildings and the Monaco Super Clinic since 2012 in some cases. Dr Clark says he met with the DHB last week and was only told about the Scott building. Look, I'm going to have a frank conversation with the acting chair and I will look forward to what he has to say about the plan. As I said earlier, I'm a little disappointed that other building issues weren't raised with me directly when I was there. Health Minister David Clark. Hawke's Bay Civil Defence is warning a naturally created dam carrying a massive amount of water could fail at any time, affecting properties downstream. The new lake was created on private property on the Mangapuakia River between Gisborne and Wairoa last month after an earthquake tr tr triggered a landslide which blocked a small tributary. The lake is now about 50 metres deep and rising 60 centimetres a day. No water is leaking from the dam, but Civil Defence staff are warning residents downstream to keep out of the riverbed. Paparatu Road is now closed to the public and specialist engineers are being sent from Hawke's Bay Regional Council to the site. The Kapiti Coast District Council is preparing for more heavy rain expected tonight. 70 millimetres of rain hit the area overnight, causing some Paraparaumu Beach and Raumati Beach properties to flood. The Council's Sean Mallon says staff have been visiting affected properties. We've just had another heavy band that's just come through uh, and just eased off at the moment. But So the guys are back out again. Uh, pumping down uh, for people on their private property, uh, offering sandbags uh, if people want those and um, basically yeah, just dealing, dealing with block sumps and other operational issues. The infrastructure group manager Sean Mallon. An Auckland councillor says he's livid a proposal to ban council staff from travelling business class while on work trips has been voted down. Councillors voted eight to nine against the proposed change, meaning staff will still be allowed to travel on business class for flights longer than eight hours. Monaco Ward councillor Efiso Collins supported the proposal and says he's disappointed that not all of his colleagues did. 
Barack Obama has been gifted a whalebone pendant and another to take home to his wife Michelle as he's formally welcomed to Government House in Auckland. Ngāti Whātua o Ōraki conducted the formalities as the former US President arrived to meet with the Prime Minister. Rowan Quinn reports. <laughs> The blowing of a conch and a karanga begin Barack Obama's warm welcome across the sunny lawn of Government House. He accepted the wero laid down by a warrior and made his way to a gazebo where Iwi, Jacinda Ardern and other government leaders were seated. There was plenty of laughter during the speeches, including from Mr Obama, who had the reo translated by the Governor-General's cultural advisor, Piri Shasha. One joke about the amount of time he'd spent golfing seemed to strike a particular chord. Mr Obama's pendant was placed around his neck before he hongied those in the gazebo. Itamaki Makoto called Rowan. It's six past five. To sport, a New Zealand lost the early wicket of opening batsman Jeet Raval after a roaring start earlier with the pink ball in Auckland. The Black Caps dismissed England for 58 in the historic day-night test. A short time ago, New Zealand were 22 for one. Performance at both ends of the court when they play Jamaica in Auckland tonight. The Silver Ferns opened their tiny Jamison Trophy defence with a 75-42 win over Malawi last night, while Jamaica had a 45-goal win over Fiji. Ranked fourth in the world, Jamaica will be a much tougher proposition for the Silver Ferns, and Southby says there's plenty to fine-tune ahead of next month's Commonwealth Games. There's still some some timing issues of past release. I think there's still a couple of things around the attacking end that we just at times get all in one area and we haven't quite created the, the options that we need to. Defensively, there's still some ball that the attacking players should be getting and they're not. Janine Southbeat. The Silver Ferns will be without Maria Falao for tonight's test as she continues to recover from a knee injury, but will welcome back Timalisi Fakahokatao in defence. And New Zealand will send its largest team to the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast in Australia following the selection of the women's basketball team. The naming of the Tall Ferns concludes selections for the Games, with the basketballers uh, taking the final team number to 251 athletes. And that's the news. Voices from the regions let fly at our national airline. In New Zealand, driving volume and profit and losing the loyalty of regional New Zealand. I've really lost that national identity as a carrier. And our dairy industry. New Zealand dairy farmers are absolutely brilliant at turning grass into milk, but are terrible businessmen. Fonterra gets the message. Yesterday's results were nothing short of appalling. I could well imagine farmer shareholders would demand a scalp, and it looks like they got T.O. The farm gates and the big end of town. Morning reports weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, two communities hoping to generate their own wind-powered electricity and calls for changes to make it easier to do so. And after 10, the human cost of military service. Former soldier Bill Blakey and his wife Nancy discuss their stories of coping with post-traumatic stress disorder. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after Morning Report on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. Northland, Auckland, Coromandel, Waikato to Taumaranui. Also Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taihape. Showers becoming more frequent tomorrow. Some heavy and possibly thundery. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay find spells. Isolated showers. Some may be heavy and thundery about the ranges. Taranaki occasional rain. Heavy and thundery at times. Whanganui to Wellington and Wairarapa, occasional rain with some heavy falls, clearing tomorrow morning. Fine spells from the afternoon tomorrow and isolated showers. Buller, Nelson and Marlborough, periods of rain with some heavy falls. They could be thundery in Buller and Western Nelson tomorrow. Westland, Canterbury and Otago, excluding Clutha, occasional rain clearing this evening, but the odd shower lingering about the east coast. Scattered rain spreading south again during tomorrow. Bekluther, Southland and Fiordland find spells, a few showers in the east and south, and for the Chatham Islands, mainly fine with a chance of a shower. RNZ National, it's nine past five, and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Thomas. Welcome, everyone. Just before we go on, something special that has just happened at Government House in Auckland. <laughs> Oh, 
if you are listening, this is a rousing welcome for Barack Obama, who is being led across the lawn of Government House in this picture, being welcomed to Tamaki Makota, of course, by Ngāti Whātua Oraki. The Governor-General is there, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, her partner Clark Gayford, a great many people standing in the rather glorious Auckland afternoon sun as Barack Obama is formally welcomed to New Zealand after a couple of days of playing golf with his mates. We will have a report uh, from Government House very shortly. Those pictures just coming in and we are editing them as we speak. Pretty stirring scenes there. But we begin tonight with the State Services Commission and its investigation into the expenditure of former Waikato District Health Board CEO Nigel Murray. Dr Murray spent $218,000 of the Waikato DHB's funding on travel, more than half of which the SSC report describes as unjustified. This is public money of course. State Services Commissioner Peter Hughes said Dr Murray's conduct fell short of what is required of a state sector leader. He was putting that politely, I think, and he would have fired him. The man whose oversight of Nigel Murray is also addressed in the report is the DHB's former board chair, Bob Simcock. He's described as having been too trusting of Dr Murray and of exercising oversight that lacked, and I quote, the rigour and standard of care expected. Now, no one knows where Dr Murray himself is and repeated att attempts to obtain him have been unsuccessful. But I spoke to Bob Simcock this afternoon and asked him what he thinks of the SSC report. Uh, look, I think uh, quite clearly they've identified that uh, Nigel Murray behaved in ways that are totally unacceptable and we absolutely understand and agree with that. Um, I think they have seriously missed though uh, the need to ask the question uh, how could this happen? And in my mind, there is a very simple answer to that that they've chosen not to look at. And that is from day one, uh, the accounts department of Waikato DHB paid bills that had never been authorised by anybody. Including you as the chairman of the Absolutely. board. Absolutely. OK. They are also, though, looking at governance, aren't they? And I'm going to go through some of the points sure. they make. Point 13. The conclusion I've come to is that the chair was too trusting of the former chief executive, and I believe the chair was let down by Dr Murray. You were too trusting of him, weren't you? Uh, no, I don't, well, I don't know what the yardstick of that is. I mean, quite clearly we had somebody put in a position of serious responsibility. He failed to meet those responsibilities, so in that, in that sense you can say absolutely we were too trusting. Uh, but in terms of the implication that um, he had free reign or whatever, that's simply not true. All of the expenses that were brought to me uh, that I authorised were justified. The fact that there were a number of expenses charged and then paid by the DHB without my having any knowledge of them, I'm not sure how that relates to being too trusting. Why didn't you have knowledge of them? Uh, look, it's impo if, if somebody is sending a bill in without it being authorised, uh, you have a right to assume that the system won't pay it. And that's the one thing that the, uh, the review or the inquiry does in fact accept but then goes, fails totally to go into, how did that happen? Doesn't that speak to point 11, the Chair's oversight, that's you, of Dr Murray's expenses lacked the rigour and standard of care expected? Well, they're certainly drawing that line. I reject that thoroughly because the things that were brought to my attention for expenditure, uh, I only authorised things that I believe were justified business of the DHB. You also authorised some things after the fact, didn't you? And Absolutely. That, but that is highly unusual. Uh, no, it's not highly unusual. If you talk to uh, chairs of, of a number of government agencies, you will find that's extremely co extremely common. Um, the, and, and there's a really interesting discussion to have whether that's a worse thing to do or a better thing to do. But the real driver of that is that the chair of a DHB is a part-time person who generally, and certainly in my case, doesn't sit in the office at the DHB, uh, a chief executive of a very large organisation like that, it's um, a $1.4 billion organisation, is going to be travelling. Uh, it is just simply not realistic to expect all of those expenses to be um, signed off in advance. No, but yours is a governance role, <coughs> isn't it? That's the reason you're there. That is the reason you are chair. And the governance is first and foremost over the behaviour of the CEO. Is he or she getting it right? Now, you had a yep. CEO against whom a whole lot of whistles have been blown. Sue Moroni, Annette King, Ian Powell from the Association of Salary well, Medical... What were those whistles well, about? Well, they, they were saying, we don't like the smell of the sky. Right. Now, now, you are a grown-up. If someone is repeatedly telling you, we don't like the smell of the sky, you would do a whole lot of sniffing, wouldn't Which you? Which we did. 
Right, but the, the SSC is saying you didn't. The lack of rigour is the thing they focus against most explicitly with you. And they're not saying that about the recruitment or the checking that we made in response to Sumeroni and Ian Powell. In fact, quite explicitly, they make the report makes the point that they did not raise issues of expenditure or control of expenditure. Their issues were around the attitudes towards staff. And we did, after they were raised, actually go back to a number of referees and check those issues with them, and none of them actually confirmed what we were being told. OK, so let's set them aside. What about the concerns that were very clearly coming out of Canada, albeit implicit rather than right. explicit, as far as I'm aware? This is a man who left Fraser Health in very peculiar circumstances. He left as a highly critical report was about to come out. He left unexpectedly and he left with no severance pay. Now he was your CEO and I know if I was you I would have been watching him like a hawk. So uh, what we did at that time is go to the person who uh, initiated that in review, that inquiry, and ask explicitly of him whether there are things in there that we should be aware about, Dr Murray, and he said that, the, that in fact the review did not hold any blame to Dr Murray. The explanation for the outcomes of the review were that uh, there had been very rapid growth in Fraser Health uh, in their catchment, uh, that funding hadn't kept up, the evidence of this is they were putting in another, I don't know, 50, 80 million dollars or whatever. Uh, we asked, you know, would you employ him or keep him in employment? He said, absolutely. If he was not choosing to leave Canada now, we have a job for him in the Ministry of Health in British Columbia. Who said that to you? Uh, the, the, the head of British Columbia Health. Okay. And what did you subsequently find out? What have you subsequently found out what about the circumstances in which Nigel what, Murray left Fraser what Health? What we've found out, and only very recently, and by the most curious of circumstances, uh, what we've found out is that uh, his chair fired him on the 24th of May, which was probably three weeks before I had that conversation with the head of health in British Columbia. Uh, and he did not alert us to that, neither did anybody else. How did you find that out? Staff were cleaning out his desk quite recently, and it's quite bizarre in my mind, but uh, they found the, the, the letter firing him. So he had put that in a desk at Waco DHB, and when he left, he didn't take it out with him. Why on earth you would do either of those things, I don't know. But they found that letter just in recent weeks. So this is a man who has been fired. You call somebody you might reasonably expect to know he has been fired. Absolutely. And he provides him with a ringing endorsement. Absolutely. What do you make of that? Oh, look, I cannot understand how that can happen. Um, is you, it, you, is you, it, isn't this Canada thinking, thank God? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, but He's off to New Zealand, yoo-hoo! Uh, it may be, but again, uh, we spoke to his chair who had left the role probably three or four weeks before this. We spoke to uh, people who he employed. We spoke to a senior clinician up there um, and all of them, and we spoke to all of his previous employers in New Zealand, all of them spoke of him in glowing terms and said we should grab him. OK, I, I, we're moving around at a rate of knocks. <laughs> but I, So let's look at the circumstances in which he left Fraser Health. And if what you say is true, he was fired. And if what we can conclude <coughs> from that is that that information was withheld from his future employers in New Zealand, that yep. is absolutely disgraceful. Weren't you effectively doing the same thing by negotiating a resignation? In other words, weren't you prepared to see this guy go quietly no, too? No. Um, firstly, it was... Far from quiet, even before we got to that point, everybody knew the inquiry was going on. Everybody, uh, our media were covering it quite extensively. Um, the State Services Commissioner has made it clear what his view of resignations and firings are. Really explicitly. And quite explicitly. Um, and I understood that in advance, and so did the board, and so did the lawyer who was giving us advice. Uh, the thing that I have to say to the State Services Commissioner, he wasn't in the room when he heard that advice and heard the reasons. So what he says in his statement is that on the information that I have, well, the reality is the board was aware that his preference would be for a, for a sacking, but the advice we received is that that would create serious risk to the DHB. Were you prepared to let him go silently to see the back of him? No. No, we were very, look, my preference would be very much for us to, to, to fire him. Part of the um, reasoning, but not the primary reasoning, but part of the reasoning around this was that the, we had uh, a draft report that we, you know, I'd initiated uh, investigating his activities. It is extremely damning. Um, we had uh, uh, quite strong legal advice that inevitably that report would come out through the Privacy Commission. Is that the report Peter Callan refers to? 
Uh, Peter, pro probably so, does. So, so, so we understand that Mr Ombler has received a copy of, and then it's redacted, draft report. We have previously expressed the view that the report was part of an employment dispute and settlement process and is a confidential document which should not have been received by Mr Ombler. Now, uh, no, uh, Mr Cullen says this report was to be destroyed as part of a settlement agreement. No, that's not true. That is absolutely not true. The settlement agreement quite explicitly states uh, that it will be withheld within the law. In other words, if there's a legal obligation for us to make that available, we will. Cullen should be fully aware that that, that, a, that draft report is held by the solicitor who did the work. What did that report say? Um, it's an extensive report. Uh, it, uh, it, um, is it more damning of Nigel Murray than the SSC has been? Uh, probably in much more detail. Uh, probably uh, quite clearly stating that he is uh, an unreliable witness in the mind of the investigator. Um, Can we hover above this, sure. drone-like, and look down at the kind of <clears throat> other discussions that were taking place in the health sector at the time? By this stage, we were looking at DHBs who were trying to achieve efficiencies and seemed on the face of it to be under enormous pressure to come in on target Absolutely. and were increasingly fail to do, failing to do so. Mm. This was yet another bad news DHB story. Sure. Did you feel implicitly or directly pressure from the minister or the ministry to manage this away as quietly as you possibly could? No, no I, I don't believe this got into that zone at all. Certainly all of the description you've given is absolutely correct. Um, the DHP is under immense pressure, uh, there are constrained fi finances, whatever the, whatever the number any government puts in place, it's constrained and in my view uh, is unlikely to solve the problems that, that exist within the health sector. Um, but no, I didn't feel direct pressure to make this go away in any way at all. Let's look at some of what this was when you say make this go away and I'm really fascinated by those trips overseas at the end of 2016. Vancouver and San Francisco, September 2016, Los Angeles and New York and Montreal, October 2016, Canada, November, December 2016. There's one trip there. Uh, this travel was recorded as part of professional development and the completion of a research project. Was he doing either? The evidence would suggest not. And when he was doing this travel that was not unauthorised, he had no right to do, was not related to work, and is an extraordinary sum of money, who was he travelling with and who was he travelling to see? Uh, we know that um, at least on one of those occasions he was accompanied by uh, another woman. Um, did, the uh, DH, did the DHB pay for that? Uh, there was one charge, the, th the one that broke the camel's back for some of the staff, senior staff after having tried to work with them and resolve these issues and so on, I understand was a trip back from uh, the States where he um, traded in his fare and then bought a fare for uh, a companion. Um, <clears throat> the so, so presumably he had a business class or premium economy or whatever. He had a premium economy. And he traded in for two economies. Traded in for two economies and charged those to the DHB. Um, there was a story and explanation given for that. Um, that explanation just doesn't make sense anymore. Does anything make sense anymore? Uh, not a lot of it. Not a lot of it. Um, uh, you know, so in the two of those trips into Canada, there was a hire car hired when he arrived. He came back to New Zealand. Uh, while he was back here, the hire continued. He went back to Canada. Some weeks later, the hire continued. He came back to New Zealand. And my understanding is the car still continued to be used for a while and it was returned and the advice I was given was that it was, the hire company said it was returned by Mrs Murray. Well, it certainly wasn't the legal Mrs Murray and, um, and we do know from emails that, that uh, there was another woman with him for I think all of the time that he was up there and probably longer and it would appear running around in a DHB paid for car. Uh, the return if is car hire in Canada and parking total ten thousand two hundred and seventy six dollars. Who was signing off on that? So no, nobody signed any of that off. That was not. That, this is my point. I had no knowledge of that. I didn't see any papers about that. I signed nothing about that. But it got paid. This travel was booked directly by Dr. Murray. Yeah. How the hell, given this is late 2016? And by that stage, we haven't seen a report on his expenses for two years. How was he able to book anything? The guy shouldn't have been able to buy a coffee, should I, he? I agree. He shouldn't have been able to book things at all. That's quite outside of the policy around bookings. Uh, but it was happening. And I had no knowledge of that. But you were the chairman of the board. Chairman, of a, you, you have to draw for me the line that says, how do you know something that nobody is willing to tell you? 
Um, you go that's... back, you go back, and you rigorously say, "Here is a man who hasn't filed expenses for two years." I think I remember the New Zealand Hero breaking the story. Yeah. After two years, he hadn't put any expenses. And you, as the CEO, as a wise and worldly former politician, say, what the hell is going on with Nigel Murray and his expenses? Show me them. Which we did. Um, so so um, at the point that that occurred, that I became aware that he had not filed expenses that he needed to, you know, this is a return to the State Services Commission, um, I went to him uh, and said he had to get that done. Uh, February 7, see this is a lot of times passed here, so February 2017 was the first time that I saw a summary of what those expenses were and immediately I recognised that relocation expenses had been charged that I hadn't authorised that were quite outside of our contract uh, and immediately went, for him and went to him and said I wanted those repaid immediately. He had an argument as to why they were reasonable, I said I'm not willing to relitigate this, you owe that money and asked him to repay them. So that happened immediately. At that point I had no awareness or evidence of other expenses that I then became aware of later on. Let's go back to your role, finally, sure. as chairman of the board. It's a government's role, isn't it? Yes, it is. The buck stops with the chairman. Absolutely. But that, but you know, there has, a to, there has, to, there has to be a Quali test of reasonableness there. Uh, absolutely, well, followed by qualification. There has to be a test of reasonableness. You, you cannot hold the chair. Uh, uh, you cannot hold the chair responsible for every event that goes on within the six and a half thousand staff. It's impossible for them to have visibility. No, but that's a reductio ad absurdum, isn't it? This is this is this wasn't six and a half thousand staff. No, this no. wasn't a junior doctor. This wasn't a nurse or an orderly. Right. This was your CEO. Right. And you have a statement in the inquiry that says quite clearly they agree with me that I had a right to assume that a bill that was not authorised would not get paid. And for me, that is the core of the issue here. That if, if from day one, if that had not been occurring, none of this could have gone on. Bob Simcock, who was, of course, the former chair of the DHB, talking to us earlier this afternoon. We would love to talk to Dr Nigel Murray. We have no idea where he is, and clearly that is a willful effort by him to simply disappear without trace. Uh, if he or anyone who knows him is listening to us, please do get in touch with Checkpoint. Uh, and if you're at the Waikato DHB and would like to react to the State Services Commissioner report or to what Bob Sincock was saying, do get in touch. 27 minutes past five to the public part of Barack Obama's visit to New Zealand now. The former US President has been officially welcomed to New Zealand at Government House a short time ago in a rousing haka performed by the students of Auckland's Selwyn College. It comes as the private part of this visit comes to an end. President Obama woke this morning at Northland's exclusive lodge, The Landing. He had dined there last night with guests understood to have included Sir John Key and his wife Brona, their son Max, Sir Peter Jackson, and New Zealand Chief Executive Christopher Luxon and his wife Amanda, billionaire businessman Craig Heatley and the former US Ambassador to New Zealand Mark Gilbert and his wife Nancy. This morning, National Leader Simon Bridges took a phone call from Mr Obama at the Koru Lounge. It was great to have a uh, brief, warm uh, conversation with Barack Obama. Uh, it was on uh, Sir John Key's uh, number, and uh, so I was very grateful to have that set up. I mean, effectively, um, John had told uh, the president a bit about me, so that was sort of nice to have. Um, and then uh, just a brief conversation about, you know, time here is really having a good time, enjoying it a lot. And I suppose you'd say a bit of friendly sledging of uh, Sir John Key and his golfing. And, um, yeah, I think the words terrible cheat uh, may have been used. Mr Bridges says Mr Obama's visit is a boost for New Zealand. I think it's great to touch base. Uh, I think what we know is that good relationships really matter. And you know, I think having Barack Obama in New Zealand is a real coup, actually. I appreciate that. And I've heard the, you know, the critiquing around some of the um, issues, on the, given this is a private visit. But the other side of, of it, I think, is his global renown means that when he is on social media, when there are pictures of him uh, playing golf, on a pristine New Zealand golf course with, uh, you know, incredibly beautiful scenery. That sort of publicity is just priceless. Mr Obama was this morning flown south by helicopter to Mangafai, where he played a second round of golf at the invitation-only Taraiti golf course, again with Sir John Key. 
After his second round of golf, reportedly again won by the New Zealand team, Mr Obama, dressed still in his golf gear, landed at Mechanics Bay in downtown Auckland just before 3pm. A quick change and a short time later he was welcomed with a Paul Fetty at Government House, his first public engagement on this whistle stop tour. Mr Obama was flanked and escorted through the Porfiri by uh, Piri Shasha, the cultural advisor to the Governor-General, and Te Amohairi Morihu, Ngāti Whātua Oraki, who replied to the karanga from her iwi to the former president. Nari Mublia from Ngāti Whātua gifted two whale tooth pendants, one for Mr Obama and the other for his wife Michelle. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and her partner Clark Gayford were among those who welcomed the former president. Ms Ardern was wearing a traditional korohuai and sat on the side of the tangata whenua during the mihi mihi. After the haka pōhuri, those gathered in the tent sang a hymn and said a karakia before the mihi mihi. The first speaker was Taiaha Hawk from Ngāti Whātua, Oraki. O Ngāti Whātua, te marae o te kāwana tanga, te marae o te iwi Māori, e mihi nei tangi nei ki a koe, nau mai, ki mai, ka ke mai. He acknowledged the time Mr Obama had spent playing golf with Sir John Key, quite a lot of it so far, and extended an invitation to the Oraki Marae if Mr Obama ever chooses to return to New Zealand. And if you're listening to that rather than watching, the pictures we have in uh, from Government House ended with the former President Barack Obama wandering off into the sunset with the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Jacinda Ardern has just had a private meeting with Mr Obama. She's holding a media conference as we speak and we will bring that to you shortly. <laughs> You are with Checkpoint on RNZ and thank you for being so. Coming up, Housing Minister Phil Twyford says he'll look at banning the practice of rent bidding after a Checkpoint investigation. Former Health Minister Jonathan Coleman, we spoke to him a lot about the Waikato DHB. Well, he's quitting politics. Auckland councillors vote narrowly against ratepayers paying for their business class travel. And Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg breaks his silence on the data scandal engulfing the social media giant. No Ninex with business, but before any of it, Anna Thomas with the headlines. Thanks, John. The State Services Commissioner says he would have fired Waikato DHB head Nigel Murray if he had worked for him. Peter Hughes today released the findings of an investigation into spending by the former chief executive during his three years in the job. It found Dr Murray spent $218,000 on travel, accommodation and related expenses. The Health Minister was not told the full extent of the leaky and rotting buildings at Middlemore Hospital. David Clark has announced an extra $11.5 million to fix one of the buildings, but it's been revealed he wasn't told about three other badly damaged buildings.
The government wants to ban landlords from passing on letting fees to tenants. Housing Minister Phil Twyford has tabled a bill in Parliament today and he expects the legislation to come into force by the end of the year. The Kapiti Coast District Council is preparing for more heavy rain tonight. 70 millimetres of rain hit the area overnight, causing some Parapara Aumu Beach and Romati Beach properties to flood. Hawke's Bay Civil Defence is warning a dam formed by a landslide could fail at any time. The new lake was created on private property on the Mangapuiki River between Gisborne and Wairua last month after an earthquake. The lake is now about 50 metres deep and rising 60 centimetres a day. A woman from Uruguay has appeared in court today after nearly $2 million worth of the Class A drug was found in the bottom of her suitcase. Customs says the 30-year-old arrived at Auckland Airport from Argentina yesterday. And the former US President Barack Obama has been gifted a whalebone pendant and another to take home to his wife, Michelle, during a formal welcome at Government House in Auckland. And if you're interested in the cricket, I as am. I know you are, Thank John, you after, of course, demolishing England for about uh, just 58, New Zealand are sitting on 46 for one in the first day night test at Eden Park. Holy moly. Yep. Thank you very much, Anna Thomas. Business Cheers. News, Nona Peltier on the other side of me. Hi, Hello. Nona. Uh, the Financial Markets Authority warning financial advisors to follow the rules when selling life insurance <laughs> policies. Do they really have to make that well, warning? Yes, they actually do. It turns out they sent out, a, they put a report out in 2016 and they basically set out their concerns. And what they're worried about is that life, in, well, it's not just life insurance. We think about life insurance as something just like a policy against your life, but it can be a number of things. It can be disability insurance. It can be, you know, income replacement insurance. It can be any kind of personal insurance. It's not the kind of insurance you put on your car or your house, okay? So that's really the difference. But a lot of companies, uh, advisors, have been selling these uh, policies. And they, the more they sell, the more commissions they make. And so if they have a number of different customer uh, clients with a, a variety of options, they may sell you a policy that you don't really need. And they're only doing it so that they can make a commission on so, it. So what's the, what's the FMA saying? Well, they're saying, look, don't do that because we're <laughs> going to come down really hard on you. This is not, this is a breach of uh, the regulations that cover uh, financial advisors. And the FMA has started looking like an organisation that can indeed come down. Yeah, really they hard certainly will yeah. in ways. There's some new uh, legislation going through Parliament that will cover this off. But for the meantime, the, the uh, FMA is warning these advisors, and if you are looking at buying life insurance, be very careful. Good advice. Sound advice under Peltier. The OCR said at 1.75. No one was surprised by that, right? This the is the Reserve Bank. Well, yeah. why would we expect anything different, right? Yeah, but <laughs> the, whilst that was the story in New Zealand, it wasn't the story elsewhere. No, that's right. In the United States, the U.S. Federal Reserve raised interest rates just as we thought they would. However, they're not going to raise them as many times as the market was expecting. And that caused the U.S. dollar to have its biggest one-day loss in, well, two months. And that pushed up our currency. So our market ended in pretty good uh, stead. We were up 72.3 US cents. Uh, well, not up that much, up to that much. 93.4 Australian, 51.1 pence. And the NZX top 50 index didn't do too badly. It fell seven points, which is, you know, hardly anything considering mm. how it rose quite strongly yesterday to 8,601. Nona Peltier, thank you very much indeed. Let's head to Wellington where the Met Service meteorologist John Law is standing by. Kia ora, John. Kia ora. As we head into Friday, we have got some wetter weather pushing back towards the western side of the north side. Some showers and perhaps as we go through towards the afternoon, perhaps even with some heavy and thundery ones making their way even across towards the likes of Auckland. Highs at 23 degrees Celsius. Some longer spells of rain are pushing down towards the northern parts of Taranaki for New Plymouth. Highs here, 24 degrees Celsius. Elsewhere across the north side, just a chance of perhaps an isolated shower, especially through the afternoon. Touch more cloud down towards Wellington. Early showers, but it should brighten up a touch as we head through towards the afternoon. Highs though, 17 degrees Celsius in the capital. A cooler feeling day through there. Generally though, a drier and brighter feel to the weather across the eastern side of the north side, but temperatures still around about those low 20 degree mark. As we cross the, onto the south end, we have got some heavy rainfall to watch out for, more especially out on the western facing side of the country. We'll find some wet weather though, making its way southwards through Canterbury as we go through the daytime. Highs still down into those uh, low teens as we go through the daytime, but some wetter weather 
the likes of uh, Nelson and those northern parts of Berwick. Watch out for those severe weather warnings we have as we go through Friday. Some drier and brighter weather down in the far south, but still perhaps just a few showers down towards Invercargill. And that's it from me. Thank you very much indeed, John. The Housing Minister, Phil Twyford, says he'll look at banning the practice of rent bidding, if you're unfamiliar with it. Rent bidding's when a landlord asks prospective tenants what the maximum amount of weekly rent they can afford is, and then whoever can pay the most gets the house. Mr Twyford was responding today to an Auckland property management company called Walker Ware, who openly offered rent bidding to landlords on their website. They've since taken that web page down after Checkpoint inquired about it. Our reporter, Zach Fleming, has more. Imagine you're a renter, you find the perfect spot. It's at the higher end of what you can afford, you apply for it and cross your fingers. But what you didn't know at the time was that you actually never had a chance. Because someone else was asked if they could pay more, and they could. I just think it's an unacceptable practice. It, um, it, it further exacerbates the market power of landlords at the expense of tenants. Housing Minister Phil Twyford agrees with cash-strapped renters that shopping our rental properties to the highest bidder is plainly unfair and will only lead to rents rising faster than they should. It's all bad news for renters and uh, I don't think there should be any place for it in, in, in our housing market. Currently there is a place for it. Anecdotally, renters have been talking about it for years. Mr Twyford spoke to Checkpoint after we brought to his attention an Auckland property management company named Walker Ware, which was openly offering it on their website. It was listed under the Why Choose Us heading, and had a flowchart outlining the simple process. Tenants bid, highest bid accepted. It's the first service they promote on their company video. To ensure a landlord's property is rented for the maximum market price, we advertise properties with a price guide only, not a set price. Competition amongst prospective tenants ensures the maximum rental price is achieved. And as well as leading to rents rising rapidly, Kate Day from Renters United in Wellington says... That completely shuts out um, anyone who's on the vulnerable side of things. So if, um, if you're a student or if you're on a benefit or if your income is limited, obviously this makes it even harder to compete and even harder to find a home. WalkAware deleted the rent bidding part of their website this afternoon after Checkpoint inquired about it. Owner Ryan Ware declined to be interviewed, but PR company Botica Butler Rawdon issued a statement saying WalkAware introduced the service in 2013, but there was little demand for it, only a landlord a year, so it stopped offering it and had simply forgotten to delete the page off its website. But Miss Day says the practice is common in Wellington. Renters are told by landlords and property managers had a bid already for, for this price, but if you put in a bit more, um, or if you give an extra week's um, rent as a down payment, you know you can um, you can have it. I have heard as well that it's um, perhaps popping up on some application forms. You know what is the highest rent that you'd be willing to pay. And controversial US rent bidding app Rentberry has confirmed it's heading here. Chief Executive Alex Lubinsky didn't respond to a request for comment today, but he told Nine to Noon last May... It's in their right, you know, essentially to rent this property to whoever they want to at the price, whichever they want to. So they can rent it for $1 or they can rent it for, you know, whatever price they want. To. But in New Zealand, that may not be the case for much longer. The government's review of tenancy laws is expected to be finished around the end of the year. We're looking at modernising all of the tenancy laws to make life better for renters. And as part of that review, we're about to do a, a um, uh, public consultation about what should go into the legislation. And within that, we're gonna look at how we can regulate or possibly even ban rent bidding. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. And today, Mr Twyford also announced he's introducing legislation that will ban landlords from being able to pass on letting fees to tenants. The Health Minister is demanding a please explain from South Auckland health bosses over leaky and rotting buildings at Middlemore Hospital. The county's Manukau District Health Board was first alerted to the problem six years ago and David Clark wants to know why he was only told about one of the four buildings that have dangerous mould. Ruth Hill reports. Documents released to RNZ News show the DHB first knew about the Leakey Scott building in 2012 and serious failures at the Kids First Hospital, the McIndoe buildings and at the Manukau Super Clinic were confirmed over the next two years. The Health Minister David Clark, who this week signed off on an extra $11.5 million to fix the Scott building, says the board told him nothing about the other problems when he visited last week. I'm disappointed the other issues weren't raised with me during that meeting. 
uh, and I uh, am expecting now the DHB to outline to me their plan for managing these issues. This is this is something that DHB should be managing and they should have a plan for uh, and I'm expecting uh, them to outline for me their clear plan. Mr Clark says he'll be having a frank conversation with the DHB chair today, although he's been assured that patient safety is not at risk. The nurses' union is furious their members weren't told. Its spokesperson, Leslie Harry, is now seeking an urgent meeting with hospital managers after learning about mouldy, rotting buildings from RNZ this morning. The delay in us finding out in the way that we have done so is really unfortunate. Uh, obviously this will be a concern to our members and the workforce generally at Middlemore Hospital. Public health researcher Caroline Shorter says many South Auckland children who are in hospital are there with respiratory problems from living in damp houses contaminated with the kinds of moulds in the kids' first hospital. She says any exposure to mould is dangerous, particularly for those with compromised immunity. It can actually increase your risk of respiratory infections, so your flus, influenzas and your um, colds. It can certainly exacerbate asthma symptoms if you've already got asthma, as well as sort of um, beginning uh, the process in the first place. Um, and uh, things like allergic rhinitis and bronchitis and things like that, there's evidence of that as well. The DHB insists the risk to patients and staff is nil because the mould is contained within the wall cavities at County's Manukau. Although it knew about the problem six years ago, it did not commission an independent assessor to do a full investigation until early last year. That report recommends urgent repairs. A spokesperson, Majiafa, says it's not fair to say the board had done nothing, it's done some temporary repairs and took legal action against the construction company Hawkins. She says the total repair is likely to be more than $40 million. We need to start with Scott Building first because it's not until you actually start the works that you realise how much you know, if it is going to take and, it's, you know, and the time it's going to take because, as you can appreciate, we can't close down whole parts of the hospital in the middle of a, a major acute demand period. County's Manukau's chief executive, Gloria Johnson, has confirmed the DHB issued legal proceedings against Hawkins Construction North Island Limited in 2012 and made a full and final confidential settlement early last year. Documents show the board was last year finalising a contract with the same company to repair the Scott building. For Checkpoint, Ruth Hill. There was a mea culpa of sorts from Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg today when he broke his silence on the data scandal engulfing the social media giant. Facebook has been under growing pressure over allegations that a British-based firm, Cambridge Analytica, accessed data from 50 million Facebook users and then used it for political activity without those people knowing. Of course, that included the US presidential campaign and the Brexit vote. The world has been waiting to hear from Mr Zuckerberg since the scandal broke. First, he put out a statement on Facebook. And then he later spoke to CNN. This was a major breach of trust. And, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Um, you know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data. And if we can't do that, then, then we don't uh, deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. So our responsibility now is to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And there are a few basic things that I think we need to do to ensure that. One is uh, making sure that uh, developers uh, like uh, Alexander Kogan, who uh, got access to a lot of information and then um, improperly used it, just don't get access to as much information going forward. So we are, are doing a set of things to, um, to restrict the amount of access that, that, um, that developers can get going forward. But the other is we need to make sure that there aren't uh, any other Cambridge Analytica's out there, right, or folks who have improperly accessed data. So uh, we're going to go now and investigate every app uh, that has access to a large uh, amount of, of information from before we lock down uh, our platform. And if we detect any suspicious activity, we're going to do a full forensic audit. Mark Zuckerberg says if you had told him when he started Facebook 14 years ago that he would be responsible for protecting the integrity of elections, he would have laughed. But he says clearly Facebook does have that responsibility and it does need to do better. I think what's clear is that in 2016, we were not as on top of a number of issues as we should have, whether it was Russian interference um, or fake news. You know, I think the reality here is that this isn't rocket science, right? I mean, there's a lot of hard work that we need to do to make it harder for, for nation states like Russia uh, to do election interference, to make it so that trolls and other folks can't spread fake news. Um, but we can get in front of this. And, and we have a responsibility to do this 
um, not only for the 2018 midterms in the U.S., which are going to be a huge deal this year, and, and that's a, a, just a huge focus of us, but there's a big election in India this year. There's a big election in Brazil. There are big elections around the world. And you can bet that we are really committed to doing everything that we need to to mm. make sure that the integrity of those elections on Facebook is, is secure. Mark Zuckerberg. After 13 years in Parliament, the former health minister, Jonathan Coleman, is calling it a day, forcing a by-election in his Northcote seat that's in Auckland. Of course, here's our deputy political editor, Chris Bramwell. Jonathan Coleman was defence minister between 2011 and 2014, then took on the health portfolio in 2014. He was the first doctor to become health minister in 70 years, but some in the sector argued his success in the role was questionable. Dr Coleman says National did a good job in health. But there will always be critics and there are always going to be areas of the health system which are tough. So if you look at mental health, that is an area that in every Western jurisdiction over the last two years has become a sudden focus for governments. I mean, it's really increased in its prominence and all governments have been looking but for was solutions. was National caught, or was the government caught on the hop on some of those health issues, particularly on mental health issues, under your watch? No, look, I think, though, the broader picture was the demand increased pretty significantly. The Health Minister, David Clark, was gracious with his message for Dr Coleman. We have disagreed on many things during our time in politics, uh, but I think uh, it's important to acknowledge that people who come to Parliament come here to serve people and they make sacrifices in terms of their own family life. I wish him well uh, for his future and thank him for his public service. The New Zealand First Leader, Winston Peters, as usual, cut to the chase. They're going you. down like flies, aren't they? Just like I told you. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Jonathan Coleman took the North Coast seat off Labor's Anne Hartley in 2005 with a majority of almost 2,400 votes. He built up that majority to more than 6,000 votes in 2017. Dr Coleman makes no apology for vacating his seat so early in the parliamentary term. The first thing is actually it's worse for a party the later a by-election is uh, in the cycle, the closer it is to the next gen general election. That's the feedback I've had uh, because you know parties have their plans set. But as I said, look, this was an unsolicited approach and sometimes you get these moments in life. Despite National's comfortable majority in North Coast last election, the party's leader Simon Bridges says it will be taking the by-election incredibly seriously. We take nothing for granted and we'll be working to gain every single vote that we can. The process is going to start for that pretty much straight away. The National Party board is meeting tomorrow and they will set in place a process for selecting a candidate, a strong candidate, to contest that by-election. Jonathan Coleman says a date for his formal resignation will be confirmed in the next few days. Atawiti Whare Pari Mata, mō te hōtaka o te ahi ko Chris Bramwalaho. A proposal to ban Auckland Council staff from flying business class on work trips has failed to get off the ground with one councillor describing the suggestion, and I quote, as inhumane. The changes would have allowed staff flying for more than eight hours to leave a day earlier or to request premium economy if they had health concerns. But councillors narrowly voted against it. Our reporter Nita Blake-Person was there. Auckland Council staff spent more than $1.1 million on 104 business class flights in between January 2016 and last August. Today, Councillor John Watson tried to rein that spending in. Our statement of intent here to deliver value for money and to secure public trust. I think to do otherwise, Mr Mayor, is just to be seen to be continuing uh, a long line of, of rather, frankly, uh, embarrassing and very public exposures of a kind of corporate excess. At the moment, council staff are required to fly economy class for flights of less than eight hours, but for anything longer, business class or premium economy is allowed if they have to start work straight away. Mr Watson's amendment to change that wasn't welcomed by all councillors. Linda Cooper was among those concerned about the pressures it would place on staff. You just have to be crammed in with a bunch of people really close together with your knees jammed up around your ears, like it happens to my husband because he's six foot two. You know, filthy toilets because they don't get to clean them in 17 hours, all of that sort of stuff. And this is gross, but that's what it's like. And so I think we've got to think about that as you want your staff to be at optimum performance when they get there. Councillor Penny Hall says staff should not be able to travel higher than premium economy, but she didn't think that it should be a request-only perk. It's kind of inhumane to put people through, and it's 
you know, I think if anyone has tried to do that, you would realise it is undoable. So I think we've got a good, you know, we hear a lot around the table around human rights and union, you know, we need to move after an hour of sitting here. Well, why do we not think about our staff in those terms too? So Mayor Phil Goff was also opposed. The former Foreign Affairs and Trade Minister says he's well aware of the risks of not being on top form while on overseas business. And it's not reasonable to get off a plane having travelled for 24 hours, go straight into a meeting and be sharp at it. I know that from years of experience. I don't think I would have got a free trade agreement with China if I worked on that basis. I'd be asleep halfway through the meeting. Either the trip is worth doing and we treat our staff reasonably or it's not worth doing it all and don't go. The amendment, which would not have applied to Auckland councillors, was voted down 9-8. to eight. But Monaco councillor Ephesel Collins, who supported the proposal, is livid. The fact that these people can get on an aircraft goes to show the kind of privilege. I represent the poorest ward in this city. And that $18,000 trip that one executive took is just a couple of thousand dollars out of what the average median income is in the ward that I represent. So that's a whole lot of money. So to be describing it as inhumane is really quite ridiculous. Auckland Council puts details of domestic and international travel expenses online annually, but councillors today requested that information be made available more regularly, possibly at quarterly or half-yearly intervals. Mō te hōtaka o te ahiahinei, ko Nita Blakeperson, aho. Christchurch's Anglican Bishop Victoria Matthews has spoken out for the first time since announcing she's stepping down. The bishop announced on Monday she would step down in May after leading the Christchurch Diocese for 10 years. During her tenure, there's been a bitter fight over the Anglican quake damage, sorry, the Anglican's quake damaged cathedral. The Synod ultimately voted to restore the building last year, of course. Our Christchurch reporter Logan Church spoke to Bishop Matthews this afternoon and asked her about the timing of her resignation. It really seemed to be the right time to do it. I've been, I'll be quite honest, in the middle of all the worst of the cathedral, I would have been quite happy to have walked to that point, but I couldn't feel God was calling me to do that. And so I stayed, and I'm very glad I did, to be quite honest. Um, but at this point, this isn't giving up. This is being called to something new, and um, God will tell me what that is in due time. Do you have any regrets? Any regrets? I think... Um, Early on, I probably should have gone to the people who were screaming the loudest and saying, we can't do it this way, let's, let's talk. We kept saying we were going to do that, and then there'd be another lawsuit, and it never happened. I wish I'd gotten in before one of those lawsuits. And who are those people you're talking about? I'm not going to name names. In terms of groups at all? Uh, heritage, people who cared about the, the reinstatement for the cathedral, but I'm not getting into names. It's not, it's not personal. What challenges do you think the diocese will face, I suppose, in the next 10 years? The Anglican Church is obviously changing very yes, quickly. What challenges do you think, the, especially the Christchurch branch of the church, will face in the, following, in the coming years? Well, we obviously still have some recovery. I mean, it's been quite a few years, but we lost so many buildings and we had real damage damage to so many more, that there's still a few uh, years of just recovery in terms of those buildings. But more important than that uh, is the greening of the diocese. There are um, significant numbers, wonderful people, don't get me wrong, wonderful, wonderful Anglicans, but they're in their senior years, they're elders, and so we're working very hard at raising up young leaders, and I think we're doing a good job. Um, we have people... Um, in youth and young adults at the university, etc., who really are attracting people who have never had a relationship with the church before. For you personally, what's your next step after you step down? I have no idea. I have no idea. This is a, a step of faith, uh, which probably sounds quite odd to people who aren't Christian, um, but I do believe God is calling me to step out in faith. And to be honest, that's what I did over 10 years ago when I left my former diocese of Edmonton, Canada, stepped out in faith, and to my total surprise, got a call from Christchurch. Got a call from Christchurch. Goodness, Victoria Matthews, uh, we always get strong responses to her uh, from both sides of the coin when she is on Checkpoint. Talking to our reporter in Christchurch, Logan Church, it's about a minute and a half before six. A lot of feedback coming in tonight. Uh, quite a lot of very pointed feedback about Barack Obama. He said, of course, yes, you can. A lot of you are saying, why the hell are we bothering you? Some of you are saying it in very pointed terms and calling him quite unpleasant things. 
I won't read that out on air in case he's listening, but a lot of you are saying, hey, he's a former president and he's been playing golf with John Key and why the hell is there so much fuss? Uh, as for flying business class, Phil Goff's out of touch. Economy should be fine for him because he's so short. That's mean. Airline seats are specifically designed to fit your ego. That's good. Regarding spending by DHB Murray, every year we have to return a uh, tax return. The DHB must have had an annual audit, yes or no. Quite fascinating that... Uh, uh, Dr. Murray's expenses weren't provided for two years uh, and eventually an enormous amount of media pressure, particularly from the New Zealand Herald, uh, made them start to publish those expenses and then the House of Cards began to collapse. Remarkable story that one. Thank you for your feedback. I worked at the Waikato DHB in a fairly low key position, position and we all knew that Dr. Murray should not be hired before he was appointed as someone who knew him in Canada had warned against him being employed. Uh, a lot of that sort of feedback coming in tonight too. Thank you. It's six o'clock on Checkpoint. RNZ News at 6 o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. The State Services Commissioner says he would have fired Waikato DHB head Nigel Murray if he had worked for him. Peter Hughes today released the findings of a State Services Commission investigation into spending by the former Chief Executive during his three years in the job. It found Dr Murray spent $218,000 of board funding on travel, accommodation and related expenses. More than half of that amount was unjust justified and about half was unauthorised or had authorisation problems. The DHB's former chair says the report doesn't fully address how the spending was able to happen. Bob Simcock told Checkpoint while he was chair unauthorised spending was taking place without his knowledge. He says he wishes he had never met Nigel Murray and believes Dr Murray's former employer in Canada withheld from the Waikato DHB the true nature of his departure from that job. The county's Manukau District Health Board is rejecting criticism that it's taken too long to act over revelations that four major buildings at Middlemore Hospital are leaky. A board spokesperson, Margie Appa, says the investigation has been complicated and some temporary repairs have been made. She says the board last year estimated that fixing all the buildings will cost more than $40 million, but it may be more. It's not until you actually start the works that you realise how much you know, effort it is going to take and, it's, you know, and the time it's going to take because, as you can appreciate, we can't close down whole parts of the hospital in the middle of a a major acute demand period. Agiapa says the board is confident there's no risk to patients because the mould has not contaminated the air. The government wants to ban landlords from passing on letting fees to tenants. The Housing Minister Phil Twyford has tabled a bill in Parliament today and he expects the legislation to come into force by the end of the year. Mr Twyford says his officials estimate about $47 million a year is paid out in letting fees, with the bulk of that being passed on to renters. He says he's confident this won't push up the cost of renting as similar laws overseas have not done that. The government is still continuing a broader review of the Residential Tenancies Act. The founder of Facebook has broken his silence over the escalating data scandal engulfing the social media giant. Facebook has been undergoing pressure over allegations that a British-based firm, Cambridge Analytica, accessed data from 50 million Facebook users and then used it for political activity. That included the US presidential campaign and the Brexit vote. Speaking for the first time in an interview with CNN, Mark Zuckerberg said mistakes had been made. This was a major breach of trust and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Um, you know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data and if we can't do that then, then we don't uh, deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. Mark Zuckerberg says Facebook will now conduct an investigation of apps on its platform and restrict developer access to data. He also said he'd be open to testifying before US lawmakers about the data breach. 
dirty recreation yards, limited communal space and insufficient dental treatment. They're just some of the failings that inspectors from the Ombudsman's office found at an extension of Aruhata Women's Prison, which is operating in the grounds of Rimutaka Prison. The facility was opened in 2017 to take an overflow of inmates from the women's prison. Anne-Marie May reports. During their visit to the women's facility at Rimutaka last September, the Ombudsman's Office inspectors found social work and counselling services were stretched and religious and cultural support was limited. Nearly two-thirds of the prisoners were also not engaged in any meaningful activities. A questionnaire also revealed more than a third of the women held at the Rimutaka facility had at some time felt unsafe and there was a growing number of misconducts being recorded. The Corrections Department announced this afternoon it is spending $10 million on the facility, including two new yards and improved gym facilities. This is Anne-Marie May. An Auckland councillor says he's livid a proposal to ban council staff from travelling business class while on work trips has been voted down. It would have restricted staff to travelling in economy but allowed them to leave a day earlier or apply to the chief executive to travel premium economy if they had any health concerns. Councillors have voted 8 to 9 against the proposed change, meaning staff will still be allowed to travel on business class for flights longer than 8 hours. Monaco Ward councillor Fessel Collins supported the ban and says he's disappointed not all of his colleagues did. The fact that these people can get on an aircraft goes to show the kind of privilege. I represent the poorest ward in this city and that $18,000 trip that one executive took is just a couple of thousand dollars out of what the average median income is in the ward that I represent. So that's a whole lot of money. Councillor Efeso Collins. It's five and a half past six. The Black Caps' steady approach with the pink ball on day one has served them well at Eden Park after their English counterparts narrowly avoided a record low total in their first innings of the day-night test, all out for 58 runs. A short time ago, the Black Caps uh, surpassed England's score with a 67 for one. After 30 overs, the players will now get to use the pink ball under lights with the night session due to start shortly. The New Zealand netball coach Deneen Southby is expecting a much tougher challenge from Jamaica in their second game of the Tiny Jameson Trophy campaign in Auckland tonight. The injury hit Silver Ferns opened their title defence with a 75-42 win over Malawi on the North Shore yesterday. Southby says the tall and athletic Jamaicans will provide a stern test of the Silver Ferns players in both the attacking and defensive circle. We know with the Jamaicans that they've got the two tall shooters and we know that there's always going to be a lot of high ball going into the back space for the shooters. So we've got to attack the ball further up the court. I think on attack it's going to be very physical, so I think it's bracing yourself for that as well. Janine Southby. The match between the Silver Ferns and Jamaica will start at 10 past 8 following the game one between uh, Malawi and Fiji. The England rugby coach Eddie Jones has been assured his position remains secure until next year's Rugby World Cup, even if the team continues their downward spiral. The Rugby Football Union has given Jones the vote of confidence despite a run of three successive defeats in the Six Nations that resulted in a fifth place finish. It's England's worst performance in the competition since 1987. And that's the news. Tonight on Nights, William Dart has a Bert Bacharach edition of New Horizons. Our changing world speaks up for the wasps, the good ones, as opposed to the bad or ugly ones. And this week's cultural ambassador, the South Auckland photographer Raymond Sangapolatele, on Polyfest, gentrification, and whether the warriors really are on the improve. And on Lately at 10, we'll have an eye on books, music, people and politics. And of course, we'll be there for the breaking news stories as they happen. We're live and we'll be keeping you up to date with the world, talking to some of the people who have made the news or are just worth talking to. That's Lately with Karen Hay on Nights with Brian Crump on RNZ National. And now the uh, short forecast to midnight tomorrow, mid uh, from the Met Service. Northland, Auckland, Coromandel, Waikato to uh, Tomaranui, also Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taihape. Showers becoming more frequent tomorrow, some heavy and possibly thundery. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, fine spells, isolated showers, some may be heavy and thundery as well for you about the ranges. Taranaki, occasional rain, heavy and thundery at times. Whanganui to Wellington and Wairarapa, occasional rain with some heavy falls, clearing tomorrow morning. 
Fine spells from the afternoon tomorrow and isolated showers for you. Buller, Nelson and Marlborough, periods of rain with some heavy falls. Now, they could be thundery in Buller and Western Nelson tomorrow. Westland, Canterbury and Otago, excluding Calutha. Occasional rain clearing this evening, but the odd shower lingering about the east coast. Scattered rain spreading south again during tomorrow. Clutha, Southland and Fiordland, fine spells, a few showers in the east and the south, and for the Chatham Islands, mainly fine weather with the chance of a shower. RNZ National, it's nine past six and you're listening to Checkpoint with John Campbell. Thank you very much indeed, Anna Thomas. Barack Obama and Jacinda Ardern have talked climate change, progressive politics and parental guilt as they met briefly a short time ago. The former US President and the New Zealand Prime Minister had a brief one-on-one -on -one meeting shortly after a very warm porphyry which welcomed Mr Obama to Government House in Auckland. Ms Ardern says they talked about world politics but insisted they kept that General Donald Trump's name did not come up. How we can make sure that the next generation of young people uh, are engaged in, in political movements and politics and as voters. Uh, we talked about pressing issues uh, like climate change and a little bit about uh, our agenda here uh, in New Zealand. I asked him for his views um, on different elements of leadership. Uh, and also parenthood, um, and he had um, tips that I think I will probably long remember. Um, overall, it was a, um, a conversation I feel extremely lucky to have had. It's clear from the response that New Zealanders have given uh, President Obama that there is a lot of warmth for him here. Um, he certainly felt that. He acknowledged the two degrees of separation between everyone and thinks that that will probably be uh, in part key to some of our successes as a country going forward. Ms Ardern talking a short time ago at a media conference. Uh, she also gave some detail of the parenting advice she received. Well, actually, the question that I asked was simply, um, you know, how do you deal with guilt? Because uh, I have no doubt I'm going to experience some of that in the future as I juggle the roles that I have. Uh, and, and his insights were, I, I'm sure, the same as any parent would probably give me, that um, you do your best. Hmm. Uh, Ms Ardern also sought advice on her current job as PM. I really wanted to get a sense of uh, his approach to leadership. I mean, you know, obviously uh, the role of being Prime Minister of New Zealand is um, something I consider an enormous privilege, but also one that comes with enormous expectation. Uh, that pales in comparison to the, being the, uh, the leader of the free world. And so hearing his thoughts on managing that sense of expectation, the weight of his decision making was something I was really keen to talk to him about. And finally, the Prime Minister gave some insight about what was said during the welcome as Nati Fatua Oraki's Nari Mublia presented Mr Obama with two whale tooth pendants. He explained that uh, the carved whale tooth uh, was gifted to great orators and orators who have the ability to uh, move um, people and uh, move entire nations and acknowledged um, that he was one of those people. Uh, he also gifted... Uh, a similar piece for Michelle uh, Obama acknowledging uh, that the leadership that she had shown during uh, their time in office together. Uh, Jacinda Ardern. Tonight, Mr Obama will host an invite-only dinner organised by the New Zealand US Council. Our reporter Jesse Chang is at the Viaduct Event Centre down on Auckland's waterfront where more than 800 guests have started to arrive. In fact, they are queued up behind you, Jesse, uh, in their dark suits. Have you spoke to, have you spoken to any of the dinner guests? Hi John, yes I have. So just earlier I spoke to Selena Tusitala Marsh who is the MC for this evening. Um, she said she was very excited. She only got the call about a week ago that she was going to be the MC and when she told her family and friends they didn't quite believe her. Um, she said this is the only event her sons are also excited about that she's meeting um, Barack Obama. Um, I've also spoken to um, Sir John Key who of course, we know earlier today it was playing golf uh, with the former president. Um, Sir John remained coy about who won the golfing tournament this time around. And any sign of Mr Obama himself yet, Jesse? No, unfortunately, no sign of the former president just yet, but there has been talk that he will probably arrive after all the guests have gone in. Jesse Chang joining us live from the Viaduct Events Centre where somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people are going in for some Kiwi Kai and that is courtesy of New Zealand chef Peter Gordon who's been flown in from London to oversee tonight's dinner a short time ago, actually a couple of hours ago now. He took a quick break. 
He sounded bizarrely calm to tell me there would be a choice of six different canopies on offer tonight. I asked a friend of mine, a good friend, Nigella Lawson, to drop another name in there, and I said to her, um, I was in London when I'd been asked to do the trick, and I said, do you, do you know anyone who's cooked for President Obama? And she said, I do. And so we had this uh, text thing went on. I got his intel, and I was told that the president loves fish, and he loves fish in that Hawaiian way that's a little bit sweet. So the... Um, so the main course, one of the main courses uh, is a salmon dish with a coconut tamarind sort of curry sauce with some quinoa and um, an aubergine relish. And I've also done a um, tuna poke. A poke is like the sort of, I guess, Japanese ceviche that's less acidic that, you, that, you, that, that Hawaii is famous for. And I was also told that he loves chocolate. So we've got two little chocolate desserts, um, which I'm so, I, you know, I hope he enjoys it. I hope he eats it and I hope he enjoys it. And, and how many are you cooking for? Uh, it's less. I've read in the papers today that there's a thousand, but it's catered for slightly less than a thousand. So um, there's quite a few people coming and, for dinner tonight. <laughs> and we're pre- pre-recording this interview at four thirteen. Now, if I was cooking for eight at four four thirteen, I'd be a bit tense. Why are you sounding so calm, Peter Gordon? Uh, well, I arrived three days ago, so I've got that lovely jet lag afternoon haze going on. And we've got a really fantastic team in the kitchen with, with um, uh, I mean, it's been fortunate for me that Sky City are catering, you know, doing the catering. And I've got my uh, team from up the Sugar Club helping us as well. So I've, I've been for the last three days in the sort of um, kitchens working with a team that I know most of them, which makes it really handy. And, uh, and it's a sunny day and I'm in Auckland and I'm thinking, oh, my God, how good can this be? And I'm going to cook for President Obama, who I think is a fantastic man. So... You know, I, there's nothing to be stressed out about, really. <laughs> Look, you've got to go. But one final question before you go. Is there a New Zealand cuisine? Does the world, now when you're cooking in London so famously, does the world have a sense of what a New Zealand cuisine is or is that still not understood? No, I, 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 I don't think we truly have a cuisine yet. I think it's, uh, I, I, I guess we've come into, you know, the cooking world sort of so much later than others. So France and Italy and everyone else, China, were able to build regional um, cuisines that uh, worked very really well for them. Um, I think we're still evolving, and we're, we're, there are so many cultural migrants into New Zealand that, you know, the, the, the evolution is quite a mixed bag of magpie picking a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, I, I don't think we do. I think we're known for really good ingredients. And probably if you ask the average person on the streets in London, what is, what's New Zealand cuisine? They'd go, oh, roast lamb, roast lamb and veggies, or, you know, they'd, they'd have, that's the view of it. But I don't, I don't think we have one. I don't know that, I don't know that we ever will have one, um, but I think we've, we've got ingredients that we're known for. You know, sea joas, which admittedly come from the Andes, you know, sea joas and tamarillos, pavlovas, lamb, beautiful beef, people are realising. Um, and I guess in the same way that when New Zealand started producing wine, we were known just for Sauvignon Blanc, whereas now we're known, you know, um, for our sort of Pinot Noir as well. And I th- it's an evolution. I-, I don't know where it'll lead us. And um, but I think we just we just haven't been cooking long enough to to have you know 500 year old recipes because they're not really. And so the ingredients are the thing, and that is what you are showcasing tonight, right? Yeah, I've, I've got some lovely. Like at one point, I thought, could I do a hangi? And I thought, no, that's just so not going to happen. Um, so I thought, okay, what can I do that sort of showcases New Zealand ingredients? So I've, I've used some um, kawa kawa and a salsa verde that we're doing on a um, vegan polenta um, kumara dish, a little canapé, and we've got some kawai um, that we're serving on a little blini. Um, we've got beautiful beef and beautiful salmon. Uh, and then desserts we're using, we've got a bit of, I've made a, um, a little tart that's a uh, peanut butter and tamarillo jelly. And we've also got a tamarillo chutney on a, a little baby lamb um, pie. We thought, well, that's quite cute to serve at an event like this, a little baby pie. Um, so I, I think I've, I've used the ingredients that I thought can showcase what New Zealand offers and grows. Um, but, yeah, it's, a, it's a, just a nice mix of cuisines, I believe. Peter Gordon, who is cooking up a storm tonight. A major investigation has slammed unauthorised and unjustified spending by the former CEO of the Waikato DHB. Nigel Murray resigned in October amid rising concern about his spending on travel and accommodation during three years in the job. 
In its report today, the State Services Commission says it was unacceptable and should never have been allowed to happen. Our health correspondent Karen Brown reports. The 58-page report says Dr Murray spent $218,209 of the Waikato DHB's money on travel, accommodation and related expenses from July 2014 until October 5 last year. More than half wasn't justified, with items worth $101,000 that should not have been authorised by the DHB and nearly $121,000 of spending that failed to meet the Auditor-General's guidelines. The State Services Commissioner, Peter Hughes, says it's totally unacceptable. This is hard-earned taxpayer money uh, and um, I think uh, Dr Murray's behaviour here is an affront to the taxpayers of New Zealand. It was not the role of the inquiry to determine criminal wrongdoing, but its findings have been referred to the Serious Fraud Office for its own ongoing investigation. Mr Hughes said Dr Murray's former boss, DHB Chair Bob Simcock, who resigned amid the scandal, was too trusting. Normal checks and balances also were not carried out by the Waikato DHB and, most concerning of all, it allowed Dr Murray to resign rather than face disciplinary action. The board should not have allowed Dr Murray to resign. That was not the right thing to do. The board, in my view, put pragmatism ahead of principle and the public interest. And this meant that Dr Murray did not have to answer for his conduct uh, in the DHB, and that was wrong. The Waikato DHB's acting chair, Sally Webb, explains why they opted to allow Dr Murray to resign and repay the money. While as deputy chair at the time, I was pretty clear we were doing the right thing by allowing Nigel Murray to resign. In hindsight, I think there's a piece of the puzzle we didn't spend enough time on, and that was the fact that we are part of the public sector. Ms Webb says Dr Murray was a bad apple and current processes at the DHB are up to scratch. Our interim chief executive does not do any travel or go anywhere without me having signed it off beforehand and understanding what it's for, and that would be the normal practice. The report also highlights the DHB's failure to seek to carry out a reference check on Dr Murray with his then-Canadian employer, which would have alerted it to the fact that he had already been told he would no longer be the chief executive there and subsequently resigned. The Senior Doctors' Union Executive Director Ian Powell says that was a major error by the DHB. He'd already resigned his position there and that should have raised a red flag at that time. But on top of that, if, if that had been further looked at, they would have discovered that he resigned his employment because Fraser Health had given notice that it was intending to terminate his employment down the track. Dr Murray is understood to be in New Zealand but has not been able to be contacted for at least six months. His lawyer would not be interviewed but in a statement rejected the SSC report saying it is one-sided, unjust and resulted from a flawed process. Mo te hotaka o te ahi ahi, ko Karen Brown tēnei. New Zealand cricket history was made in Auckland earlier this afternoon when the first day-night test match on these shores officially got underway at Eden Park. And by golly, it got underway with a bang. RNZ Sports reporter Clay Wilson is at Eden Park and joins us now live. Clay, can you hear me? I can, John. Loud and clear from the sun-drenched Eden Park. Uh, yeah, you lucky fellow. Let's start, with, <laughs> let's start just in case people are just turning on the radio and haven't caught up with it. What did England make batting first? Just 58 all out, John. It was certainly all happening from the first ball this morning. Uh, at one stage there, they were in danger of breaking a record, which is held by New Zealand for the lowest test score in the history of test cricket. 26 was that, and at one point, England were 23 for 8, 27 Holy for my. 9, and then only a, only a last wicket stand of, I think, 33 got them out to 58. But an hour and 34 minutes, it was certainly a brilliant effort. Trent Bolt, six wickets, and Tim Southey, four. Uh, England's the sixth lowest test score in, uh, in their history of test cricket, which, of course, goes right back to the start of the format. So um, certainly New Zealand have been, have been doing brilliantly, and they've already worked their way into the lead. 79 for one, with Kane Williamson already, already reached his way to 50. Right, so we're 20 ahead with nine wickets in hand. Gosh, tell me about uh, that six for... Uh, what, 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 was, it the, was the pink ball doing something, or was it just really good bowling? Um... I think the general consensus is the pink ball wasn't really a factor. It was certainly moving a little bit, but perhaps no more than a red ball would have. It was just brilliant bowling and probably combined with that uh, not-so-brilliant uh, batting from the English. Mm. But uh, certainly it wasn't anything out of the ordinary and it wasn't uh, 
I wouldn't say the pink ball was necessarily a factor there. Uh, Day-night cr uh, cricket. It's still test cricket, though, and the crowds are drawn to uh, 2020 in one day. Well, what's the crowd like at Eden Park there on a What night is it? Is it a Thursday night? What's the crowd like, Clay? Thursday night, and I guess a beautiful evening helps. I guess this concept was designed so people could go through their work day or during the weekend, get things done in the morning and then come down and enjoy a large portion of the day's play. And that seems to have worked. It's steadily built out the back here of Eden Park. They've set up a little night market, uh, bean bags with a big screen, and people are lapping that up at this time of the evening. So a, a really healthy smattering. No official numbers yet, but certainly a, a lot bigger than you'd see for a normal test match. Clay Wilson joining us live from Eden Park where he is having a thoroughly lovely day at the office. It's 24 minutes past six. The former Prime Minister Helen Clark says a bill that would quadruple the maximum prison sentence for people supplying synthetic cannabis reflects a failed war on drugs. Ms Clark is a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy says the proposed legislation won't work and could cause greater harm. Political reporter Benedict Collins has more. The National MP Simeon Brown's bill would extend the maximum prison term for supplying synthetic cannabis from two years to eight. At a conference on drugs at Parliament today, Helen Clark said the failed global war on drugs has had devastating consequences for individuals. She says the proposed synthetic cannabis law change is more of the same. That is heading in the war on drugs direction, which isn't going to work. But uh, going to a select committee with a bill is one thing. What will come out the other end? And I think all the people who know about drug policy, know about what's working around the world, need to come to the committee and spell it out as it is. Ms Clark says the countries with the harshest drug policies have the highest rates of drug-related harm. You look at the United States and Russia, Russia, which both have very harsh uh, policies at the federal level. Uh, they also have very high uh, rates of drug-induced death. She says it's time for New Zealand to have a fresh look at its drug policy. So we have to look at the evidence of what works and if we look to Portugal or to Switzerland or any number of countries now, we see more enlightened drug policies which are bringing down the rate of death and not driving up prison populations. But Simeon Brown says the people supplying synthetic cannabis are merchants of death and need to be punished. So my bill's not locking up drug users, it's not locking up those who are victims of drug abuse. Um, my bill is targeting those who are selling it and some of those people probably aren't even using it, but they're making money out of people who are suffering from addiction to these drugs. You don't think people who are selling drugs and in, look, in look, the drug trade are using drugs? Look, I, I don't know. Mr Brown doesn't see any need to change the law on drugs. We don't decriminalise something for the sake of it. We don't just, we don't just make it legal. We actually have, we have laws in place because these things are causing harm. People are making money out of people's misery and those people don't uh, they deserve to be, they, they should be locked up. The Drug Foundation's Executive Director, Ross Bell, was disturbed that National and New Zealand First MPs backed Mr Brown's bill. Getting tough, having longer sentences, etc., uh, doesn't actually get rid of the problem, and it makes the problem worse. And so it's really disappointing to see Parliament last night you know, go for this more punitive response. The bill passed its first reading last night and will now be considered by the Justice Select Committee. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Benedict Collins. They are young, they are passionate and they are future Māori leaders of their generation. That's how a group of rangatahi have been described by the Moko Foundation, a charitable trust that's sending 12 young Māori to New York to the UN Indigenous Permanent Forum next month. Tu Manu Kōrehi reported Te Aniwa Huri Hanganui spoke to some of the winners. Ngari Pare Rangopo went to Kohanga Reo in her family's garage in Fakatane and says everything about Te Ao Māori was instilled in her from a young age. But Ms Ngaropo quickly realised the Māori world she grew up in was not the reality known to most New Zealanders. She remembers just weeks ago how a stranger made her feel inadequate and small because of her race. I was at Salvation Army getting myself some drawers and someone backed into me. This lady got up, looked at me and like automatically racially profiled me. The way she conducted herself and how she spoke to me and, and it was really confronting. Ms Ngarapo says experiences like these inspired her to apply for the UN Indigenous Issues Conference in four weeks' time. She'll now join 11 other successful applicants in New York where they'll learn about Indigenous issues around the world and give a speech. 
She hopes to learn how to mobilise her people. At the end of the day, it's always for my whānau, hapu and iwi, so I just want to take all those learnings from the forum, learn what I can from all the awesome, intelligent people out there in the world and just bring it back to my whānau. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko hinera pa māori puha tōku ingoa, heuri hau nonga te kaunga nui te pāna apanui. Hine Raparupuha, who grew up in West Auckland, will be joining Aripare at the UN. She got the news while paddling on a waka with her Fano in the Chatham Islands. She says she wants people to see the beauty in being Māori. I thought that everyone who was Māori is just like me, who can speak te reo, understands Māori customs. But going out into the world, I realised that most Māori don't have the luxury that I have, trying to connect with them and as well as people who aren't Māori, help them see the beauty of who we are. Tēnā tātou, ko te wehu mahu te right tōku ingoa. He uri tēnei no ngā tirangitihi, ngā rua kine, ngā te whakaue, ngā te raukawa, he pānga hoki oku ki rotoa. Te wehi o mahuru right from Rotorua was also selected. He says he and his siblings were privileged to grow up immersed in their culture. Mr Wright says it was eye-opening to learn not everyone could speak te reo or even pronounce his name properly. He says educating people about his name was the first step in realising and appreciating his Māori tanga. Saying, look, you know, it's probably easier for both of us if you actually try and pronounce these words and that was, I guess, one mechanism in which I tried to gift what I was gifted um, to everyone around me in the, in the hope that I just raise a little bit of awareness or, or appreciation to, to things Māori. Mr Wright says he's excited to learn from other Indigenous people and bring his knowledge back home. The Moko Foundation received more than 300 applications within 48 hours and say they were completely blown away by how passionate rangatahi are about advancing te ao Māori. Mo te hōtaka o te ahi pōnei, ko te aniwa, hurihanga nui aho. And on that rather wonderful note, we end Checkpoint for tonight. Thank you everyone for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow at 5. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. The former chairman of the Waikato DHB believes the true nature of the departure of its disgraced chief executive from his job in Canada was hidden. Christchurch's Anglican Bishop Victoria Matthews says she regrets not reaching out earlier to heritage groups over the fate of the cathedral. The